in our Horizon series. I'm Jean Howden. Elric initiated this series of webinars as part of our mission to help create a better future for the livestock value chain. The topics covered in this webinar series are having and will have direct impact on the future of Ontario's livestock sector. Each webinar is complemented with a white paper co-authored by CEO Mike McMorris and Chloe Newdorf, our communication assistant, with invaluable input from a well-known and respected expert in the topic area. You can find all of our white papers and recordings of the previous webinars on our website, livestockresearch.ca. During the presentation, please send your questions along using the Q&A function, and following, I'll bring questions forward for discussion. And now, I'll ask Chloe to introduce today's speaker. Enjoy the session. Thank you, Jean. Today, we are pleased to welcome Dr. Michael Von Masso, OAC Chair in Food Leadership and Professor in the Food Agricultural and Resource Economics Department at the University of Guelph. Mike is a contributing editor to this white paper and well-versed in the subject of animal-free meat, milk, and eggs. In addition to his role at the University of Guelph, Mike has a food-focused blog and podcast where he and his team discuss topics and issues of interest in the food system. He works to keep the University of Guelph at the forefront of food sector analysis here in Canada. We are pleased to have Mike as Elric's expert on animal-free meat, milk, and eggs and he will speak on this subject in relation to the livestock industry. Thanks, Chloe. And I appreciate the opportunity to talk a little bit about uh, animal-free meat, milk, and eggs today. Um, I've got uh, a few slides. I'm going to get going right away, and, and uh, I look forward to addressing questions afterwards. I'm going to start with sort of what is it? Uh, and I think that's, a, that, that's an important question. And, and frankly, we're talking about two separate issues. There are plant-based products proteins and other products, beverages, bioproducts uh, that, that compete sometimes directly with livestock and sometimes uh, sort of tangentially with livestock. And then there's cellular agriculture, sort of what we've heard of as quote unquote lab grown meat uh, and also fermentation products. And I'll, and I'll go into that in a little bit more detail here uh, shortly. Plant-based products, these aren't new. And, and while we have this sort of perception of newness around uh, you know, the Impossible Burger and Beyond Meat uh, and, and sort of more communication around, uh, around uh, plant-based proteins, uh, we've been eating plant products all along. I remember, uh, uh, you know, I'm gonna sound like a grumpy old guy. I remember when I was a kid, uh, you know, there were meals that we ate lentils and those sorts of pulses and, and all sorts of things. So uh, these aren't new. What we're doing is we're seeing an increase in the number of products that are available. And that's making some of us uptight. Um, we're also seeing sort of while, while we've historically had sort of pulses and other plant proteins, we're now seeing these development of analogs, what I call protein or or meat analogs where, where they're trying to actually replicate the experience, you know, the burgers with heme and that sort of thing, where they're trying to replicate the experience and broaden the appeal of these plant-based products. We're also seeing some, some people talk about, you know, one of the critiques of some proteins historically, some of the pulses has been how to cook them. And we're seeing people look at sort of uh, ways to make those more convenient for people. So I think we're getting a lot, of, a lot of attention here and we're seeing some growth. We're also seeing some blended products where, where you have meat and plant-based components blended together uh, for uh, sometimes for cost reasons, sometimes for uh, marketing reasons, uh, sometimes for flavor reasons, but, but that's happening more and more. Uh, this market, uh, I mean, you can see estimates all over the place, and I just pulled a couple of numbers uh, from some reports that I've read. Almost $30 billion in 2020. I think that's probably around the more novel products, but, but the expectation is these will be more than $150 billion. And, and don't hold me to these specific numbers, but what it says is th this is growing, and, and there are more uh, there are going to continue to be novel products in this place and growth in consumer uh, demand for them. On the cell egg side, 
uh, really there are probably two categories that we would uh, that that we would probably look at. The first is the lab grown meat we've all heard about. It's not technically animal free. Those are our animal cells, but we're not using animals in the in the in the growth of those products. Some of these early products are in the market for about 25 bucks US. You can get a small basket of chicken nuggets in Singapore, uh, lab grown chicken nuggets. Uh, economics on these are not yet clear, but there are products coming. Uh, depending on, some people will argue that these will never be economically viable. Others will argue that we're getting pretty close with several of these things. Uh, the truth is probably somewhere in the middle that some products will be successful, some won't. I think the reality is these products will come to the market. Um, now, doing chicken nuggets is one thing, doing, uh, you know, a muscle cut with, with, uh, with uh, uh, fibers and that sort of thing it remains to be seen. We'll, we'll have to see where we get to. Uh, but again, if we're doing this now, the, 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 all I'll say is the technology isn't as far along as it is set in a say with the, with the plant-based products, but there's pretty clear evidence that these things are coming. There's also the fermentation products and there are no animals here, although sometimes we take genes out of animals uh, and put them into yeast or, or bacteria and then grow in, in fermentation tanks. Uh, these are more ingredients. We're not growing a steak in a fermenter uh, or milk in a fermenter, but we, we can grow casein and whey right now. Uh, and Perfect Day in the U.S. Uh, has products on the market. I, I, I read somewhere in 5,000 stores that have this uh, uh, fermented casein and whey in a frozen dessert uh, uh, rather than, uh, rather than uh, actual dairy proteins. So, so these products are here. These are more ingredients, uh, and they'll be the, the, it'll, it'll be interesting to see how these how, how these things evolve, but they will. I mean, clearly, casein and whey, particularly some dairy proteins, are in excess now. Does does the rise of these uh, exacerbate some of the problems we have uh, with the relative proportion of ingredients in the dairy industry? So I think that there's some some uh, some sense that that this will play a role but i think the lab grown meat is probably going to be bigger for the livestock sector specifically my understanding is they can now ferment some of the key ingredients in cocoa uh, and uh, and make chocolate from fermentation products uh, now that's not directly related to the livestock industry but it shows you that some of those technologies uh, are coming along uh, uh, quite significantly there's a wide variety in predictions of market size. It depends more on technology development. And, uh, you know, plant-based is still technology development, but there's some consumer acceptance. Consumer acceptance will be important here as well, but technology development, getting to, you know, getting it to market and, and having consumers accept it. There's much, much less certainty, uh, much less certainty here. But I've seen estimates of, of, of sales as big as $95 billion by 2030. Excuse me, some wide variation. So, so it's something that we should be paying attention to. So what does it mean? I'm going to move a little bit now away from sort of the, the technical stuff. What are these products? I think we, we've laid a bit of a foundation there. And talk a little bit about how consumers are going to be thinking about these products, which will lay a foundation for my finish to say what what can the what can the industry do uh, in anticipation of these products. So the first thing I'm going to say is, and, and this is this is as Chloe said, this is kind of my area of, of focus is is consumers and how consumers think about uh, some of these products and think about food generally because that will be really an important, uh, probably the most important uh, factor in driving how these products come to the market, grow in the market and how they are positioned versus traditional livestock products. And that will sort of set the context for thinking about how the livestock industry can respond to those. So the first thing I'll say is food is not a commodity anymore. 
Consumers are looking for specific combinations of attributes. There is way more choice out there than there has ever been before. You know, they're looking for health, provenance, uh, where it's from, how it's produced, what's the impact on the environment, how all of you know, animal welfare, all of these things. And, 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 and the reality is that producers and food companies really sort of balance sort of those different attributes in, in offerings. And, what I, what I think is important to highlight is that there is more choice out there. We're seeing more choice in restaurants. We're seeing more choice in, in retail. And that becomes critically important. And I think there's an important distinction to make. First, uh, it's not that we as individuals want more choice. It's that we as individuals want different things. And, and managing that providing us with those choices becomes critical. So in some cases, the rise of plant protein might not be we hate meat, we just like more choice. And I think that that distinction for some customers, for some consumers becomes important. It's also fundamentally changing supply chains because as we build this differentiated product into the market, you know, Angus beef versus, you know, other beef, uh, uh, organics, all of these things means that we have an increasingly complex infrastructure to move stuff we're not putting it all in the same bin we're not putting it all in the same uh, in the same freezer all of it matters uh, and it also changes the relationship that individual producers have with that supply chain they're not just dumping it in to a great big pool of that product in some cases they are developing direct relationships with the processor who has a direct relationship with that retailer uh, and and that provides uh, that those changes become important. And in fact, I would argue that those changes will become critical to defending the position of traditional products in the marketplace going forward. Reiterate, uh, consumers have very little understanding of how food is produced. Um, you know, we ask consumers, you know, chickens raised for meat at slaughtered by the age of four. Uh, more than 50% said, I have no idea. They're, they're honest. Um, less than 40% got it right. And then there was a, almost 10% who said, oh, yeah, that sounds about right. Similar sort of story around a dairy cow gives milk only after calving. What that highlights is, is that consumers really have very little understanding of how food is produced, particularly how uh, livestock is raised and we have the, the, the challenge of, you know, there's some willful ignorance remains there as well. So they don't have a good understanding, but they do care. They're thinking about things, but not everyone is thinking about all things. I could show you similar graphs for welfare, for GMOs, all sorts of things. And if you look, this was uh, how people feel about antibiotics in farm animal production in Canada. So there are people who are sort of uh, you know, roughly a third who say, geez, I really don't know uh, the, the, the honest ones. And then there are people here on this side, on the right here, who say, yeah, generally we think it's very good or pretty good. Uh, you know, less than 5% say very good. People think it's pretty good. And then there's these people over here, probably a quarter, uh, who, who are unhappy. Now, that again highlights that there's not sort of a universal opinion on these things. Males are somewhat more positive uh, perception than females. Uh, older folks have a more positive perception than younger ones who are more skeptical. So again, it's not uh, like these people are uniform, uh, uh, uniform in their opinions of these products. And we often talk about and think about consumers as being uniform and homogeneous, and that's where we run into trouble. So we ask people, uh, how important is each factor when you choose a restaurant? You know, price is important. We allowed people to give to distribute 100 points. Um, uh, and so price and taste is important. Uh, brand is less important here. And then you have all of this sort of employee welfare, environment, producer welfare, animal welfare, healthy meal options. There's some variety here. And, and, and so this is table stakes. And these things are the things that differentiate you and get you in the market. Now, it's not everyone who said all of these things are important. What this highlights is, again, the differences among 
consumers. So uh, in some in some cases, people will be making plants-based choices because of environmental welfare. In other cases, they'll be making them with respect to animal welfare. And, it, and frankly, for, for, for the industry, it'll, it'll be frustrating sometimes. It'll be a bit like whack-a-mole, which one of these things. And the truth is, for specific customers, we have to address their specific concerns, which means this is more complex, but it also means that there's not going to be a single product that hits a home run and sort of undercuts uh, everything that animal agriculture has been doing over, over time. So, so it's a bit of a good news, bad news story. Uh, they do respond to specific words. You know, they like things that sound good. They have no idea what a nest box is as an example, but boy, that sounds like a good thing to do. And they don't like things that sound bad. They don't like the word antibiotics, which I think is, a, is an issue for, uh, for, for animal agriculture, because we know we're using antibiotics uh, in responsible ways. Uh, and I'll talk about that uh, in a second here. They don't like the word cages. Uh, and so when we went from battery cages to enriched cages, in some cases, we didn't make that much progress because consumers still hear that word cage. Uh, susceptible to surprises. I'm not going to, I'm noticing I'm running out of time here. I'm not, you know, Buttergate talked about production practices, added confusion to the issue. We see hidden camera events. We see marketing. Who would have thought, uh, I, I never in my lifetime would have thought that in a quick service restaurant commercial, I would see someone holding a handful of grass with roots and say, this is what's important in my burger and not have a picture of a burger. But we're seeing things like that and those sorts of things are becoming important and again it's highlighting that people are thinking about some of the or, or at least open to thinking about some of the things that are important here these things matter in terms of talking to consumers this is a, and the numbers don't matter but this is a breakfast sandwich and what we wanted to do is say can you fool people by talking over here, look what a great job we've done with the egg, but not talk about the sausage in the other hand. And so clearly enriched housing for layers is better than enriched cage, but both of them are better than traditional battery cages. Gestation crates are actually negative, which means that there are some people for whom if it's raised with a gestation crate, they just won't buy it, which, which I think is an important finding. And then open pens, there's a, there's a positive. Now, when we said, okay, well, we've only got one and not the other, we significantly decrease the value of those things. So what that says is customers care, if, if customers care about welfare, they compare about all welfare. You can't just talk about one of those things. Information makes a difference too. So as you talk about the benefit of enriched cages or enriched housing, or give them more detail about gestation crates, you actually increase the value. And so that reiterates the value of engaging and communicating with consumers. Um, we also did the same thing around information with antibiotics. These are, um, I believe these are numbers related to beef production. Uh, and so we talked about reduced antibiotic use, which is essentially what we're doing in today's in new, new regulatory environment and no antibiotics. So when they don't have a lot of information, the whole raised without antibiotics becomes more popular and reduced antibiotics is good, is more than half. But when you give them more information, you talk about the value of antibiotics, you talk about the regulation of antibiotics, the no antibiotics comes down and the reduced antibiotics uh, closes the gap a little bit. So again, engagement, talk about, that's not going to work with every consumer, but it, it starts to say, here's what matters to consumers. Here's how other, uh, uh, other products are going to differentiate themselves in the marketplace and, and what we can do to talk about what we're doing uh, well here. We also looked at, at whether making a commitment. I, I often get asked the question, do we talk about it after we get there? Or do we make a commitment and, and talk about it? And do we get some credit as an industry or as an organization? Uh, and again, we looked at commitment for enriched housing for layers and consumers were offered choices between products, no animal welfare commitment, a commitment with, where, to say we're going to enriched housing and we're 25% of the way there up 
go 100% of the way there. And what we found was just create, just making the commitment creates value. And I, and I talk about this in the context of this discussion, because I think the industry can continue to say, look, we're moving forward. We don't have to be all the way there, but, but there is value to consumers in talking about what we are trying to do. And approximately 85% of the value was achieved at 75% of fulfilled commitment. So, so making a commitment and talking about it makes some sense. So what can the industry do? Innovate and adapt. Uh, thinking about the types of products uh, that we're bringing to the market, right? Cons I talked about consumers liking more choice. Uh, you know, are there different, are, you know, we've got a lot of smart people working on plant-based products. We've got a lot of smart people working on cellular egg products. We, sh we also have some smart people working on uh, animal-based products, and we need to continue to do that in order to offer more choice, in order to talk about, uh, to, 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 to meet the demands of consumers. Talk about production processes. It doesn't mean we have to change how everyone raises a beef animal, how, how everyone raises a, a, a pig, but it might mean that some people like this kind of thing and other people like that kind of thing. And that might be the way to, to more effectively, quote unquote, defend against some of these products because not everyone is choosing those new products for the same reason. And so again, not playing whack-a-mole, but saying this individual com customer looks for, is making choices based on those. Can we provide them a product that meets that person's needs? And looking at markets, you know, we continue to look at new export markets for Canada. Uh, you know, the reality is that that we see people eating less meat. Uh, the truth is uh, that trend will probably continue as we get older. Some people choosing to eat meat less frequently. Some people choosing to eat smaller portion sizes. Some people choosing to to bring more variation into their market. I would argue, and I meant to say this earlier. I would argue that a big part of, uh, of, um, of the cut, you know, we talk often about, oh, it's the vegans and the vegetarians, and they're a relatively small and stable part of the market. We're not going to get those people, although there's considerable churn in there. Lots of people do it for a while, and then uh, and there's some attrition, but the, the total numbers stay pretty consistent. Where this where the biggest challenge I think for the industry is, is in that sort of 50 to 80% of consumers who say, I'm, I'm thinking about eating less meat, I'm diversifying my diet. They're the ones who are driving some of these changes. And they're the ones, frankly, uh, you know, lots of vegans and vegetarians don't love the idea of the impossible burger. They're really there for people who are looking to, from, from my perspective, looking to sort of uh, diversify their diet. Uh, looking at other markets, I said, and understand the consumer. I used the words the consumer, and I should have said understand consumers. Uh, talk about what matters to them. As an industry, I'd argue that, that, uh, that agriculture generally and livestock specifically talks about what's important to us and sort of we talk to ourselves instead of really understanding what's important to consumers. Uh, and, and, and I think that that's an area perhaps that's under researched. It's, it's sort of over here in the, in the, in the, in the corner of, um, uh, of communications outreach, but not, not in an area where we, we really think about in terms of what should we producing for these consumers. Uh, what can I do as an individual? Engage a conversation, listen, uh, listen, and not just speak. Uh, we can take baby steps, and and I think the future is still bright for agriculture. But as individuals, we need to we need to be active in that discussion. So, thank you. I think I maybe took a couple of extra minutes. Some shameless self promotion here at the end. Uh, if you're uh, if if you don't get an answer uh, or or you have a, a follow up question, that's my email address. I'm happy to respond. Uh, I tweet lots on on agricultural issues, so you can follow me. And as Chloe said at the beginning, 
uh, my website, foodfocusedwealth.ca. There's a blog there that I comment regularly on issues. Uh, there's a podcast, uh, a recent episode talked about cellular agriculture. So a lot of these issues, uh, take a look uh, and, uh, and uh, feel free to provide feedback. So thanks, Gene. Uh, I hopefully didn't go too, too long here. Uh, and uh, we're okay here now uh, for questions. Yep. No, thanks, Mike. Really appreciate it. And uh, the information you had was certainly worth listening to. So there was, I, I sometimes have been known to be a stickler on time and cut people off, but I just couldn't. Okay. And um, I was going to say, Karen Daynard's put a question in it. And it's funny, I was trying to word the same type of question in my head, but she did a really good job of putting it down. So what do you think the animal livestock industry response should be? You have touched on that a bit. I disagree with some responses from the industry where we go low to the fear factor. I feel there's room for both, but our response needs to be positive and animal welfare based. Uh, well, I'm going to agree because a lot of that was a statement. And yeah. I, think, I, th I think there's a couple of things I talk about. I, I had a conversation with a beef producer in Saskatchewan not that long ago, and, and, and we get really defensive. And, and traditional meat and traditional livestock products are the incumbent. We have the greatest share here. And so everyone's coming to gun for us. And, and, and rather than defending and going low and attack, I mean, so rather than attacking and going low, I think we need to remind people why, why, why they like the products uh, that, that the livestock industry produces. And, and I think it gets back to that point I made right at the end. We need to understand what's important to consumers rather than reiterating what's important to us. And, and so we often, get, we often get very defensive when someone attacks us on something and, and then we say, oh, well, here's the truth and you're not any better and all of that. We, uh, we get... Uh, we, we, we need to engage in that conversation. We need to understand what they're looking for and we need to articulate the value we bring, you know, and, and, it's, and it's about healthy, healthfulness. You know, if you eat, uh, if you eat meat in, in, in moderation, it's good for you. It becomes essential for, for uh, uh, essential for all of the amino acids and all of those sorts of things. I think, we need to stop feeling so attacked and start being strategic about how we engage. The truth is, these products are going to take some market from us. That, 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 is just the, that is just the truth, and we can't do a lot about it. Figure out who our good prospects for keeping are and, and communicate to them in a way that's relevant and effective. Well, you used a beef example. So Dan Ferguson has our next question, and he asked, do developing... QA programs like uh, Verified Beef Plus, I believe, shoot me, Dan, I, I don't think I've got that quite right, and Ontario Corn Fed Beef help move us forward or raise doubts as to the commodity beef being below these standards? That's always, a, Dan, uh, thanks for the question. That's always a, a, an interesting question, uh, and I think that uh, I'm going to answer that in, in a couple of ways. I think it's okay to be different. So, so there's nothing wrong with being different. There's nothing, no, you know, brands differentiate themselves in the market all the time. And so saying we do this doesn't mean saying someone who doesn't do that is automatically bad. What it means is we need to articulate what we're doing, why we're doing it, uh, and, and, and realize that some people will choose not to and some customers will choose not to buy, uh, choose not to buy it. Uh, you know that's that 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 that's fine, and 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 I and I don't think we need to be too worried about it. So do uh, do uh, do 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 those types of programs work? I would argue that they can work if they are talking about attributes that matters to consumers, and and that's where I think these programs have sometimes fallen flat. We, we like to verify things that we think are important and that we feel good about uh, rather than saying, is this important to a customer? And then let's do it. And we often make those standards so broad that it almost 
makes it easy to, to for anyone to meet. So if they are effective, uh, then then I think they can be good. And I don't think we need to worry about denigrating other people's. We're talking to specific types of customers. Thanks. We have one other question for Karen Daynard again. Is the plant-based meat growth due to immigration, i.e. Hindus and Muslims who shun beef and pork? Uh, the answer to that, Karen, is uh, maybe partly, uh, but I don't think it's a significant component of the growth. I think what we're seeing is there are some people uh, who don't eat red meat. Uh, some of those are doing so for religious reasons, others are doing it for other reasons, health reasons or, 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 or welfare reasons or whatever. Uh, and so, uh, you know, some of these people who don't eat red meat are eating chicken and, uh, and other products, uh, lamb, which, uh, and so, so uh, it's, it's, it, it's not necessarily, you know, I guess Hindus are vegetarians, but, uh, uh, but, but, uh, what, what I think is being a, a more important driver is, again, that, that sort of 80% of Canadians who are saying, well, I want more variety or I want to think about my environmental footprint, so I'm going to reduce the amount of meat I'm eating. I think there's much less threat. There, there, there's, there's less threat and there's also less we can do for people who just don't ever want to eat those products. Like a vegetarian or a vegan, we're not going to convince differently anyway. But for, for the person who's saying, I need to eat a little less, then we can talk about the environmental benefits. We can talk about welfare. We can talk about the things individually that matter to them and make it relevant. But just like there's no silver bullet in the defense against these people who are sort of biting at the margins of our share, uh, there's, not, there's not a single reason that we're seeing uh, those plants. You know, uh, I have a son who is a committed omnivore, sample of one, I'll concede that, who's a committed omnivore, uh, but he'll, he'll make himself some ground uh, beyond meat every once in a while just for a change. If he sees it on special at his local grocery store, he'll make it. He says it's just a nice alternative. So I think those kinds of people are as important as the people who are not buying it at all. Okay, that, that, that leads right to the next question. Someone says... Do you see products like the flexitarian burger from President's Choice, which has chicken and vegetable proteins becoming more popular? I, I, I definitely do see that. You know, I, you know, I, I was walking through, uh, I, I've seen it a couple of times. I, 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 was, I was talking to a friend of mine who's a restaurant owner and, and he's gone to a, a beef and mushroom burger uh, partly from a cost perspective, you know, restaurants are getting squeezed, uh, partly from the story that, you know, they can tell a, a story about differentiation. Uh, I was walking in the university center the other day and one of the patties you can buy is a mixed beef, pork and lentil burger. I think that that gives people still that mouth feel and that flavor that they get with maybe allowing them to say, oh, <clears throat> it's maybe a bit healthier or it reduces my impact on the environment. I think those blended, those blended products, again, in a, in, in a, in a meal that is, that is, that allows for it, uh, has potential to, again, for a specific consumer segment to, pr to, to preserve them uh, uh, with eating some livestock products. So that actually, offers some opportunity for the livestock sector. So we're better to be informed than stick our heads in, heads in the sand and say, this is just gonna go away because people are gonna realize it's an over-processed product. Yeah, I think, I, I think that there, you know, there is processing in some of these products. There are high degrees of processing. And, and in, some, in some ways that makes sense to go to go aggressive uh, at, at those things to highlight those those differences, but but again, I think there's a couple of things. That I'm going to reiterate, Gene, what I said earlier that that uh, 
we need to understand what consumers are choosing and why they're choosing them so that we can tell our story. And it might be a health story. You know, so we, it might be an environment story. It might be a, can you imagine not having roast beef on a Sunday night in, you know, you can tell I go back to beef. I apologize. But uh, on, a, on a Sunday night, talk about tradition, talk about familiarity. All of those things, I think, become, become very important but doing it in a way that understands. That's not to say we shouldn't continue to do research on improving feed efficiency, shouldn't do research on understanding emissions, shouldn't do research on you know, uh, intensive grazing, uh, on different feedstuffs, all of those things. I think we need to continue to do them, but we also need to think about what are consumers wanting and how do we either change or articulate what we're doing now in a way that keeps that consumer. The last point I'll make is again, we are the incumbent, right? We have almost 100% share of this market. Anyone, we, we feel attacked because people are nibbling at the sides uh, and, and it's a bit like putting your finger in the dam, where's the leak? But there are gonna be multiple leaks and we have to talk effectively to what the person who's leaking out there wants. And, and I think that pretty much answers the next question we've had come in was how, how do, how problematic do you think people with ethical concerns or people concerned with GMO food will be for industry progress? To me, to me, that's an interesting question. We've done some work on GMO labeling. We haven't done a lot of work on GMO labeling relative to, uh, uh, relative to livestock products, but I, I'm not convinced that GMO has been a, you know that that, you know, that that GMOs are driving a lot of decisions for consumers right now. There are some consumers for they see the green butterfly, the GMO verified. They love those products that helps them. I don't think labeling everything else. Our our research suggests it doesn't make any difference. And in fact, sometimes if you put a label on, if it's the nice nice color, it actually increases demands because people don't look at it. They just think, oh, it must say something nice. Uh, so I think uh, GMOs are a relatively uh, unimportant question right now. Now, that's not to say it won't arise. I think once we get into some of these gene editing, we're doing a bunch of work right now on gene edit, consumers' perception about gene editing and livestock. I think it's pretty clear that livestock becomes more sensitive than, than grain. Uh, and I also think it depends on, on what on what, uh, uh, what the benefit of that gene editing is. Is it a producer benefit? Is it a consumer benefit? Is it an animal welfare benefit? The last thing I'll say is, you know, that cellular egg, that fermentation product, those are also genetically modified yeast organisms uh, uh, that are producing these cases. They're not doing that naturally. So there, there's gonna be all of these things uh, all over the place. So again, it depends. The, the, the things that matter will matter differently to different consumers. And it becomes important for us to be able to do that. I'm going to ask one last question from Deb Stark. You spoke a bit about substitutes for ingredients. Do you have any sense of how disruptive they will be to the full value chain? Deb, that's a great question. And the answer is it depends. I think to a significant degree, we don't understand what some of these ingredients are going to be. So it depends on which technology will emerge. But let's look at the, the one that's out there already, uh, sort of this ability to ferment uh, casein and whey. Now, dairy proteins, we're already swimming in dairy proteins and, and the industry is having trouble getting rid of them. Now, that's, uh, that means that, that, that those, those ingredients particularly low priced uh, and and that the competitors are going to have to be pretty cheap in order to compete in that marketplace but it also means if they get there that it exacerbates our existing issue already that we're producing too much uh, protein and not enough fat in relative proportion to, to meet to meet demand so I think that if we start to uh, if we start to produce, ingredients or, or, or sort of elements of 
uh, our output. You know, we're not going to we're not going to grow an entire pig carcass or an entire chicken carcass. We're going to grow components, and and it's those components can be disruptive, and and in some cases it can make it in, ingredients might make it easier for someone who is just an ingredient user. So yes, I think there is the potential that they can be significantly disruptive depending on which products come to the market. Thanks, Mike. And I wanna thank you very much for your presentation, answering our, the questions, for editing the white paper, which you can get off our website. Um, Charlotte Wall, who quietly sits behind the scenes and pulls, does the technical assistance for all our webinars. Thank you, Charlotte. Um, Chloe gets big thanks in the fact that um, she's pulled all of this together for, for uh, Elric. I want to, again, just mention to sign up for our newsletter. You can follow us on Twitter. The recording of the, this will be available, and we'll send links to all the participants that um, to we'll hopefully get that out as, as soon as we can. I also want to point out on our website that there are five articles that summarize discussions and presentations that were part of the 2021 Future Food Tech Alternative Protein Sub Summit that was held virtually in August. And I'd encourage you to read them. Some of, you know, there's things you'll, you'll read that uh, I can tell you that Mike McMorris, there was a couple days he uh, had uh, some, just from comments that were made about, negative comments made about the livestock industry, I would say his blood was boiling. Um, we are planning one final webinar for 2021. It'll be in early to mid-December. We don't have the, the date ironed out on that, but the topic will be ag disruptors. I want to thank everybody for joining us today and enjoy the rest of your day. Bye.